Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. So um, I'm uh, talking to you as an academic in the UK, which is still part of Europe, <laughs> just about. <laughs> Um, and but also as somebody who works with the International Serious Adverse Event Consortium. So um, what I do is, uh, as an academic, I direct the MRC Centre for Drug Safety Sciences. For those of you who do not know, uh, the MRC is the equivalent of the NIH uh, in the US, except we have much less money, of course, <laughs> um, but, but we haven't been uh, stopped from giving coffee to people. <laughs> So if you come to and see us, we will give you some coffee. Uh, the, 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 this is, this is the sen uh, mission of the MRC Centre for Drug Safety Science, to really undertake a leading age science, train the next generation of drug safety scientists, understand the mechanisms of the type of serious adverse drug reactions we're looking at today, and to develop strategies to improve the benefit risk ratio of current and new medicines. That means developing diagnostic tests, predictive tests, but also using the chemistry of the drug to be able to design new safer drugs, as was suggested earlier on. So we work with uh, um, academics, other healthcare groups, plus also uh, industry and other uh, types of organizations. And that was why we were sort of started working with the SAEC. The SAEC is set up by Arthur Holden. The mission is shown there, which very much aligns uh, with what we do with the MRC Center for Drug Safety Sciences. That is, identify DNA variants useful in understanding the risk of drug-induced serious adverse events. That's the ISAC's mission. Now, the SAEC has been looking at various different phenotypes, uh, serious cutaneous adverse drug reactions, drug-induced liver injury, uh, and uh, also recently started the drug-induced renal injury. The important aspect over there is that because there are different patients being uh, recruited to all these different phenotypes, one can actually start looking across the phenotypes to see where there are common genetic factors, so that common genetic factors which lead to skin uh, versus liver with the same drug. Um, and, and that's going to be very important as the work of the SAC in terms of undertaking all the whole genome studies comes to uh, fruition uh, in the next year or two. Also, within the same particular group, for example, within the serious cutaneous adverse reactions, um, then you can, we also have different phenotypes. So I have been leading uh, the serious cutaneous adverse reactions, but we called it ITCH, International <laughs> Consortium on Drug Hypersensitivity. Uh, for obvious reasons, um, and, and this is what we have uh, managed to do, have 12 international centres, 50 UK centres, and over the last four years have collected 1,500 patients. Um, this includes Stephen Johnson syndrome, toxic epidemic necrosis, but also DRESS, but also some AGEP cases, but also we've been interested in type 1 hypersensitivity reactions, anaphylaxis, um, associated where there's been immunological testing done. And all of these cases are collected to uh, specific phenotypic criteria, but also we have a, uh, independent adjudication of these cases. And uh, uh, Dr. Neil Shear sitting in the front and uh, Peter Friedman in the UK are two dermatologists well known in this area. I think you are well known, aren't you, Neil? <laughs> so, so who then undertake the adjudication. Uh, and they spent many hours on the telephone with us undertaking the adjudication after having received uh, the case reports. So in terms of the SJSTN, so the data I'm going to show you is unpublished. I'm not going to show you some of the specific alleles that we've identified, largely because we need to validate those alleles um, in some replication sets, apart from the end uh, case study I'm going to show you. But these are the uh, um, SJSTN cases that we've collected uh, in terms of the different drugs uh, the patients were exposed to. Um, and uh, um, it includes many different ethnic groups, uh, but if you just look at the Caucasian cases, uh, what we have are a mainly northern European population, but also um, a Spanish and Italian population. And if you look at the sort of uh, clustering there, you can see that uh, the clustering of those uh, Caucasian uh, populations from Europe uh, in association with the controls that we've utilized within the GWAS studies. So the question that we've, we've been asking is that are there any drug-specific associations you can identify, which is what everybody else is doing, but also are there any um, disease-specific associations you can identify? You could hypothesize 
that the disease association with SJSTN, uh, irrespective of the drug, is probably there, but it's going to be a much lower effect size as in a complex disease, and therefore you are going to need much larger number of cases, for example, as in di type 2 diabetes. Um, and, and these are data which have just uh, come out. Now, um, this, this, this is data um, which, which still needs further work on it. But what we're finding when we actually look at all SGS, uh, Caucasian SJS cases uh, is that there is something appearing in the HLA allele area, and it's a very low frequency HLA B allele. Uh, but also in chromosome 8, we're finding a protein kinase. Now, we do need to validate this, but it is, it is nevertheless uh, interesting to be able to show you that. Now, I don't know whether this is um, not drug-specific at the moment, because there are certain drugs which are appearing, but there are many other drugs also in there which are showing the same allele uh, in, in there, which is interesting. Now, when we actually start then uh, stratifying by the different uh, self-reported ethnic groups, we find that this is mostly driven by Italian uh, SGST and cases with 40 cases, and the HLA-B allele, which is the rare allele, uh, is appearing with an odds ratio of 133 with the 95% um, uh, uh, confidence intervals as shown and a p-value, as you can see there. Um, and then when we actually exclude the Italian cases and look at the Northern Europeans and then look at the Spanish populations, there is no other population-specific signal appearing. Mm. So it is being driven by the Italian cases, and that is why it is also important to look at ethnicity uh, when you do these kind of analysis. But again, we need to be able to do further work whether it is being driven by one particular drug or a couple of drugs uh, in that population. Now, um, in terms of drug-specific associations, we are, um, obviously, there are associations we're finding which, which, are, uh, which are already well known. For example, uh, with the allopurinol, uh, only nine cases, Caucasian cases, we are beginning to see again uh, 5801 associated with uh, allopurinol. Uh, but then there are other drug-specific uh, drug uh, studies we've done. I only have time to show you one particular example, and that's with trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Again, 17 SJS cases, uh, um, against 5,000 uh, 5, controls. We're finding some genome-wide uh, associations with a nice stack on the Manhattan plot, as you can see, um, on chromosome 3, uh, chromosome 6, 13, and also on 20 and 20, 21 and 22. Um, and again, these need to be looked at in more detail and validated uh, or replicated uh, in other populations. And what we need to do is now find some replication cases. And obviously, when you are looking at something that rare, it is important to be able to collaborate glo globally to be able to identify new cases so you can replicate. These could still be positives, despite the fa uh, this could still be false positives, despite the fact that they are uh, above genome-wide significance. Um, and so, um, just to give an example of how we tried to do this with nevirapine in an African population, we undertook a prospective study uh, in Malawi uh, where we identified uh, individuals prospectively or who had had some degree of hypersensitivity. Uh, it was either a macular papilla er erythematous eruption, um, DRESS, SJSTEN, or drug-induced liver injury, undertook GWAS studies, but also have been undertaking some proteomic studies, and I don't have time to be able to show you that, but although our mission uh, has been to identify predictive biomarkers, what we're also interested in looking at um, prognostic and uh, diagnostic biomarkers, and we've been looking at this particular uh, protein called HMGB1, high mobility group box protein 1, where uh, you can look at the total uh, levels, which, which uh, uh, by an uh, ELISA test, but much more important is to actually look at the isoforms that stratify, uh, which stratify populations according to both mechanism release, the acetylation status of HMGB1, but also function in terms of radox status. And there's some very interesting data which are coming out uh, with HMGB1. So here's, uh, here's this of uh, uh, in just an SGSTEN, 51 SGSTEN patients and 182 torrent controls. And the only sort of uh, uh, association that we get is on HLAC. We've undertaken uh, sequence-based typing, and we see that this is HLAC0401 uh, associated here with the Um 
And obviously what we wanted to do from this was to go and replicate it. Um, so we started um, uh, identifying cases again in African population, uh, some in Malawi, but also some in Uganda and some in Mozambique. And when you put it all together um, and uh, uh, do uh, for this particular hit, uh, RS hit, which is uh, RS number up there, you find that it is genome-wide significance with an odds ratio of 5.17. Now, so we think the HLA CO4 one in the African population does increase the risk of uh, SGSTN in that African population. So what we want gone on to do is to undertake uh, sequence space, next gen sequencing of, of these particular uh, HLA region uh, in a subset of patients with SGSTN. And what we identify is that there is a non-synonymous variant, uh, which is in complete LD with the RS number I showed you before. So this is in complete LD. And this non-synonymous variant leads to an amino acid substitution, which is present in the alpha-1 subunit of the peptide recognition site of HLA CO401. And we're just undertaking some molecular docking studies to see how navirapine, or potentially its metabolites, might be able to fit in there and how they lead to the SJSTN. But although we've talked about um, the parent drug being responsible, it is also important to note that metabolism may still be important. And this is done in such patients whereby we've been actually looking at whether patients uh, bioactivate navarapine to toxic metabolites. And we've done that with various other drugs by looking at whether there is binding going on to human serum albumin and using a mass spectrometric methods. And you can see that navarapine does form adducts in patients who are taking navarapine uh, chronically uh, and the binding occurs particularly on histidine 146 uh, on the albumin molecule. So it, uh, that just gives you flavor of the work that's been going on with the SAEC. So I think SAEC is a public, private public partnership that has worked well and has managed to recruit well phenotype patients. Genome-wide approaches are now beginning to bear fruit and there'll be much more uh, coming out. We are furthest ahead with type one hypersensitivity reactions and we've got some very interesting hits coming up, uh, hopefully uh, going to be published in the near future. Um, global collaboration, I think is very important to be able to further some of these findings. Um, but I think although we are looking at genomic data mostly, and that's what we mostly looked at today, uh, I think it is important to identify diagnostic and prognostic biomarkers uh, and some acknowledgments there to and to many others who are not mentioned on the slide. Thank you for your attention. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes. So um, I may have missed this, and I'm sorry if I did, but um, in the Italian SJS, um, did you say what B allele that was? I didn't, because we need to validate it. Okay. It's a rare variant, rare, rare allele occurring at less than 2%. In Italians? In Italians. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Are, are there common um, alleles for that crossover from SGS to some of the other skin reactions, which are more common or more, more frequent? Uh, where you, where uh, the finding of a disequilibrium or finding of a signal would actually also imply that SJS could also be included. That is, or are these allele markers always specific for the particular disease? You, you mentioned one slide where you actually pulled different kinds of skin reactions. Mm. So I was wondering whether you found certain markers which actually cross over to different kinds of serious reactions. So um, I, I, th that is further work that needs to be done. Um, and uh, um, with 1502 and flucloxacillin, uh, so, sorry, 5701 and flucloxacillin, um, we've not only identified with liver injury, but we are also identifying some patients with 571 who have type 1 reactions, anaphylaxis, as well as uh, AGEP as well. Um, so, so there is some crossover between alleles and the occurrence of different phenotypes. But, but with 1502 and carbamazepine, that these seem to be very specific for SJS, TEN. So I think it does vary uh, with drug um, and, and, and the kind of phenotypes you're looking at. So I don't think there is a one specific rule for everything. And certainly with, if you look at 5801 with allopurinol, there is association with SJS, TEN, but also with DRESS as well. So, can I just follow up? so if you were developing a drug and you saw a signal, let's say with even maculopapic erythema, and uh, would, you, would that be for you a cause of concern for this particular disease, or usually not? Given the point, the problem that 
powering is what is so sure. uh, challenging for this disease. You need really a lot of post-market exposure before you can see something. Yeah. Um, I, I, I guess your question is, is, is does a macular papillary erythema act as a, as, as a kind of signal for the occurrence of more severe reactions and whether the same HLA association? The problem is that there's not enough been done on the macular papillary exanthems and the genome-wide association studies. And part of the problem there also is the causality assessment because uh, getting a macular papillary exanthem may be not um, entirely drug-related. There may be other factors there. And the causality, causality association is much more difficult to assess in macular papillary exanthem than it is in SJST. We have uh, two more short questions and two more short answers. Okay. Um, how much of your case finding uh, has been amenable to um, structured queries of electronic health record data as opposed to manual? Uh, all of this was manual. Um, I did uh, um, do some work on electronic health records and looked at the phenotype. And, and I won't tell you which country it was. I won't tell you which, which particular provider it was. Uh, but uh, I did 150 uh, records, and not one of them fitted in with the criteria that we had. David? Hi. Uh, David Margolis, University of Pennsylvania. When you're grouping people as Italian and Spanish and English, is it all based on location of origin, or is it genetic ancestral markers, or it's self-reported? Answers. Okay, so, so when we classing them as Italian, Spanish, etc., it's self-reported uh, ethnicity, including uh, the grandparental background. However, um, what we have also done is obviously the GWAS. We've done some population stratification analysis, and you, I showed you that data um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the the uh, uh, the plots. Uh, on there, um, and, and those uh, those are the sort of uh, Northern Europeans, Spanish, and uh, and uh, Italians, according to according to the uh, principal component analysis. Okay, thank you very much. Interesting acronym you picked, since itching doesn't come along with Stevens Johnson or T E N, at least in my limited experience. Uh, we're, now we're going to hear from Thailand, uh, Dr. Uh, Chantratida from the, um, from the uh, Rama Thibodi Hospital in uh, Mah Mahidol University in Thailand. 